professionally what's going on in the job search how are you mark i'm doing very well let's let's hope let's hope that well let's be intimate but let's also be relevant how does that sound uh, yeah, well, we don't have to talk like it's 2011. Indeed, it's now 2021. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, jobs, the job search has changed even from two years ago, uh, which I think the theme of what we're uh, talking about here is your book is Good Comes First. Uh, going to be released here in another few weeks, I believe. You're actually you're closer to the October time, right? As opposed yeah. to the yes. first of September. So we have a yeah. little time to uh, to put that. We'll be out that uh, first week in October uh, on podcast, but people have access right now. And uh, we are streaming, in case you're w wondering what I'm doing, streaming to LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, later on, it would be up on the on my YouTube channel. Uh, Mark has, uh, I've uh, written for U-Turn back in the day uh, on several occasions. And uh, Mark has been on my podcast several occasions. And we worked in many other different settings as well. But uh, all in all, this is the second book that you've worked on. If I'm not mistaken, I think there was a book in between there somewhere. I feel like I'm missing, but I think those are the two that the, there's two that are on the market right now where you were really involved. And, and it, when I first heard the title, I was not surprised that that was you because I think that has been, <laughs> if there's been a subtitle to everything that you've talked about, this is it. Good comes first. Well, well, first of all, thank you. That's a huge compliment. I, you know, Mark, you, you said that the job search has changed uh, in the last two years, uh, maybe even two months, let alone, you know, 10, 12 years since you and I've been hanging out talking about this. Mm -hmm. But I'll right. tell you what hasn't changed. Company cultures haven't changed. And, and I, uh, this book came about because me and my co-author became more and more frustrated that we were sending people out into the job market only to have them become disappointed and uh, frustrated mm -hmm. and and they just couldn't find the right the right culture for them and and so we we took our experience and said what what if we what if we built company cultures based on the doing of good and not just for your shareholders but mm -hmm. your your employees and your candidates and and your interns and of course, your customers and other stakeholders, and and that's that's what brought us to to good comes first. Is we, especially as we climb out of this you know newest wave of the pandemic, mm -hmm. we want leaders to to look at their cultures now and say what can I what can I do better? But even even more important, perhaps we want job seekers and candidates to look at their careers and say why would I go for to work for a company? I know I got to pay the bills. But why would I go to work for a company that I know sucks? They're, mm -hmm. I, I can I can see on Glassdoor they suck. I can I can see in the media they suck. I don't like the way they treat their customers and their employees on social media. But boy, I I need to pay bills. Well, let me just st take a step back and see. Do I have Do I have any runway there? Can I really afford to 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 hold out for a culture that that actually fits me, my personality, my my dreams, my goals, um, my values, and that. So that's why we wrote "Good Comes First. Yeah, yeah. I I think as well is that that there's also an underlining. Um, I mean, I talk about strategies all the time, but good is a strategy, but also happiness is a strategy as well. Is that people now underline? Yeah, they want they want good jobs, but I think ultimately people want to be happy in a good job, <laughs> and they want to be happy with somebody that's that's considering the best treatment of them first, not the one that's you know going to be the the net uh, that they when they fall. Uh, that there's going to be this net waiting for them and that's going to be the good. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be that that's going to be first rather than that being last. Well, Mark, you've been talking about this since I've known you with 2009 and, mm -hmm. and 
Uh, happiness is a strategy. Good is a strategy. Mm -hmm. And and I'll tell you, you see what's happening now. You you your your last guest touched on it. Uh, there there people are leaving good jobs because they're not good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not good for their souls. They're they're not good for their values. They're right. they're being they're being asked to tell mistruths or to or to you know to fudge reports or to or to you know, union shops being asked to actually slow down their production. Oh, we're doing too much, right? Well, you can't go home at the end of the day thinking about that stuff and feeling good. You can't go home and, and feel happy about that. And and that's what we're trying to change. And and what we say in the book over and over again uh, is is we, we want to build a world where, world where there's good people doing good work for a good company to work for. And and that's our that's our goal is we want happiness we want good to become a strategy yeah they the there's an anomaly in a good job uh because it pays and a, a company that's not good because the way they treat is is the uh thing that needs to be eliminated from our vocabulary and our mindset as well that we have to you know stick it out and survive it you know like our fathers and grandfathers did well you know there's a big part of it right this whole generational precedent that that um that feels like an anvil falling on our head you know, mm -hmm. there's there's almost a, a a guilt that comes with uh, with well, my father was never happy at work. He just paid the bills. My mom, you know, she just did what she had to do to get by. We aren't we aren't supposed to enjoy work. You know, my grandfather sure didn't enjoy work. Well, you know what? Times are different now. The world is different now, and mm -hmm. and people, like I said, they're voting with their feet. You look at. You look at some of these old school leaders that are insisting that they're employees after being given all this freedom and all this autonomy to work from home, to make their own decisions, to set their own hours. And now these old school leaders are mandating that we're going to come back in the office and it's going to go back to the way it used to be. It's going to go back to normal. Well, mm -hmm. the old normal for 90% of the population sucked. There was nothing yeah. rewarding about it except the paycheck. And now, you know, from yeah. from, from Wall Street to, to Pennsylvania Avenue to Silicon Valley, all these leaders are sticking their necks out and saying, no, you're none of that matters. The last 18 months doesn't matter. The Delta variant doesn't matter. It's time to get back to work. Either either get back to work or or resign. And and people are resigning, moving on in record numbers. It, we've We've never seen a migration of talented workers like like we're witnessing right now. They're saying, no, I'm not going to work like that anymore. You know, I liked being home for my kids. I liked being home for my mom or my dad and providing elderly care. I like being home for my dog or my cat, right? I, I liked having more balance, and I'm not going to go back to the way it was. I'm not comfortable with that at all. I'm not going to spend three hours on a train just to work seven and a half hours and, and 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 I'm supposed to be happy about that? No, I'm not going to do that. And and a good thing for employers because there's a good, there's a whole bunch of really talented people on the market right now that weren't just a couple months ago before the the JP Morgans and and those kind of companies said, fine, you're either going to come back to work, or you don't have a job. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think people when people dig deep. The, it's interesting that the intelligence that you can get these days right now on LinkedIn and Glassdoor and all those to find out what the company MO is and why a whole bunch of good people left. And when people see that people like them are leaving, they're going, that's a red flag, a flag automatically. So at what point to leave? So they can contact the person and ask that question now. They're just, we're not six degrees of separation anymore. We're maybe one or two uh, ties uh, that we may be connected. So really the questions that job seekers can ask now is, you know, you know, how is this company? Please tell me the truth. And then we can look at the company and see where the red flags are ultimately when we dig a little deeper. So, you know, you can't hide, uh, you can't hide pebbles where they're supposed to be gold. 
That's right. Well, I remember one of our first conversations, Mark, you and I talked about the best question a job seeker can ask in a job interview. Yes, we did that uh, probably the last time we yep. spoke. And and the answer to the our answer that one of our main topics was ask why, why is this job open? Mm-hmm. And and people still don't do that very often, unfortunately. But right, and you don't. And sometimes we talk about this. You don't get an honest answer. You don't get a direct answer. You right. don't even get. You sure don't get the answer you want to hear. But if the interviewer hears that question and hems and haws and tries to find just the right words to explain what's going on, you don't have to hear the answer now because you know they don't want to tell you the truth, right? Mm-hmm. So right. Uh, on the other hand, let's just say it's, it, it, let's just say it is a, on, on the surface, a, an unpleasant answer. And somebody says, look, we just, we just had a very talented young lady leave this position because she wanted to work from home. And we're, we're, we're um, shifting back into our old normal. And, and that, uh, that didn't appeal to her. That's why this job's open. Well, mm-hmm. you just got a really good answer and now you can judge. Well, wait, I was going to ask later in the interview if I could work from home and now I just got the answer to that. So now mm-hmm. I'm much more informed than I would have been otherwise, right? So right. Even, even if you don't get the answer you want to hear to the why is this job open question, then it informs every decision you need to make from this moment on. And it's it's a it's a it puts you as the, the interviewee in a, just a powerful position. Sure. And a, a good answer is a, a, a good, an honest answer isn't always going to be the one that you want to hear. And in fact, sometimes it's even better to say, well, they told me the truth about it. And I've heard from other people that this is true. But they seemed, you know, that informs my next question and say, well, is this going to be permanent or are you going to be open to having people work from home or at least a hybrid? What what does the future look like? And, you know, we don't have to accept every single answer as the single only answer. Uh, you know, we can ask other questions that will mitigate uh, uh, what we really need to hear and what we ultimately want to hear. And that may lend to being a good culture because you've been honest, not just giving a standard line. Well, and expectations have been set now, right? You know exactly yes. where you stand and, you, and you're making the decisions based on the facts, not, not what it says on their About Us page or the Careers page or in the job description. You're you're making you're making uh, you know life altering decisions based on real data, and that's and you can't ask for anything more than that. Right. So, what are some of the other uh, subplots uh, that are, may be relevant in this time that we can expect from the book? Well, I, one of the things that we do, and I and w- we realize it's risky uh, given. That, that I am, and so is my co-author, an old white guy, um, is <laughs> we, we call today's business leaders out on the carpet. And we, we, we say they are, they are afflicted with boomer male syndrome and that they're leading mm-hmm. how they led in 1979. Mm-hmm. And, and the world isn't like that anymore. Diversity matters. Inclusion matters. Equity matters. Pay equity matters. Um, d- different colors and genders in the in the boardroom matters, and and we can't build a good comes first culture without that. It it so fundamentally, foundationally, we challenge today's business leaders to look around them and to say, mm-hmm. uh, "Am I am I surrounded by other old white guys? Mm-hmm. Am I?" Am I afflicted with boomer male syndrome or BMS? Am I part of the problem? I mean, leaders, you know, leaders, you've been in this business mm-hmm. a long time. Leaders think they're the answer. Mm-hmm. Well, what if yeah. the leaders are the problem? And, mm-hmm. and our contention in the book is that those, those suffering from BMS are, are uh, just a, a distinct part of the problem. And, and it, we know it's going to ruffle some feathers, but we're never going to get to the building, the, the co-creation of good cultures if, if we don't come out and talk about the stuff that matters. And diversity matters, equity matters, inclusion matters. And, and so 
um, we we start the book that way, and uh, and and we we hope we do um, make people feel uncomfortable because that's going to help us start some tough but meaningful conversations. Yeah, and one of the things I think is as unestimated in uh, being an older black guy, having uh, lived that life uh, for all of my life, is many times that people don't realize the ghosts that are in the past oh. uh, uh, of those folks, because that's what they automatically go to uh, when they're hedging and they're being hesitant, is that they would have to confront those ghosts from the past, and those ghosts are come in many different forms, even of parents and grandparents, that that is something against the values that, that, that they were taught. So therefore, instead of telling you that, they're going to say, no, we, we can't do this right now, or we need more data, or we need more time, or we need more we need reports, more people, we need consultants. or we need more people to agree with us. We need, we need, you know, uh, we need the same, our competitors to do the same before, do before us, before we start to do it. And it's like so much for being business and being a leader. <laughs> in that respect because sometimes you know as a leader you do the things that are uncomfortable because you're asking people to do the uncomfortable every day well mark i'll tell you in um in in research for the book we took a poll and it wasn't a scientific poll it less than a couple hundred people so you know take mm -hmm. that for what it's worth but we asked people to self-identify based on race and gender and mm -hmm. I will tell you that that when we asked the question, does my company act with integrity, about 44% of the white people said yes. And mm -hmm. uh, about 74% of the leaders said yes. The numbers mm -hmm. were half of that for, for non-white people and, and uh, half that for females. And so, mm -hmm. Not only are, are we not taking on those ghosts, not only are we are, are, are we left it, leaving the past unresolved, we're 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 hiding from the present. We don't, we don't want to face reality. I mean, and the data shows that it's like, um, you know, the the other funny thing is if we and we knew that going into the question, if we asked. 20 people for their def definition of integrity within the corporate environment mm -hmm. we'd get 19 different answers and 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 that's within the book that's why we're asking people uh, leaders to not only take a look within but but then to start actually defining what their values are and not, not just saying oh well one of our values is integrity well what does that mean because if we're getting 19 different answers to the to define integrity question probably pretty important to define what that means within these walls right so right so we're, we're we're not we don't we don't want leaders to throw another poster on the wall saying well here's our mission and here's our values we want them to live those values we want them to define them and and then mm -hmm. align their company to them and and only then can we really get to the bigger issues you know that that that, that are that are not just plaguing the, the world of work, but society in general. The, only then can we can we really put good first, and and so that's our goal. Yeah, because there's unresolved issues in the past, they only resort. Many of them only resort to one thing, and that's to force the past on the present. It is similar to putting uh, new wine in old wineskins, so to speak. It, it only it is it's going to have a disastrous, and it has been disastrous uh, um, for those companies. And just like um, you know, my last guest had talked about is that you know if you're still asking for data, uh, the conversation's already over. Because right. I think we had the data, we have the eye test. Uh, there's enough uh, um, pigeons uh, carrying messages stating that <laughs> that th this way of doing business is not only not profitable, but it, it's, there's no way to reconcile the relationships that have been uh, burnt because of it. Um, 
only but to say that, hey, it's just time to start something new and start doing something that's really going to cost you something because that's, uh, you know, whenever big companies or companies in period, they don't want to apply something, they want to throw money at it and think that that's going to resolve it. And that's unfortunately, that doesn't work. We know that doesn't work with the homeless, right? You know, I gave it the office, but, you know, right in front of you is the person suffering and that doesn't solve anything. Well, not only, Mark, do we want to throw money at the problem, and and by the way, HR's been a, uh, HR's been guilty of this for decades, right? We don't actually mm-hmm. fix our diversity problem. We just we just start yet another program that that's going to take on the issue, right? It doesn't do yes. anything, but it makes us look good, right? And right. and so we invest in this program. Um, we don't we don't just invest money though. We we invest our influence. When a CEO mm-hmm. gets up in front of the company and says, declares from his soapbox that from now on diversity matters, but then the next day something that shows that that's not really true happens, then that big speech is now just a podium of lies. It, it, didn't, it didn't help us get to the truth, right? It was passionate, it was powerful, maybe influential, but it's only influential until the next instance of 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 some of something bad happening is tolerated. And and you know the other the other the other part of that true can be true also, Mark. If we mm-hmm. say if that if that CEO gets up and says uh, zero tolerance policy starting right now, right? And how many times have we heard that speech? The next yeah. morning, uh, somebody displays a behavior that is counter to the speech that was given yesterday. Well, mm-hmm. if that person has walked out the door right now, right now, like, no, mm-hmm. we just said yesterday that we were not tolerating disrespectful behavior of any kind in this company. You've mm-hmm. been warned by HR four times already. You heard the speech yesterday. This is your last day. This is your last minute at this company. And they're walked out. Now people, from from the most veteran employees to the newest intern, now mm-hmm. they look at that and go, "Wow, yeah. th- th- that now that was powerful." Words are powerful, but the action that I just witnessed or heard about that that's culture changing, and and th- that's the kind of change that's sustainable. That's the kind of change that's real. It isn't just you know the proverbial lip service. It's no he. He meant it. She meant it. We're we're changing starting right now. And that's what I mean by, uh, and that example is perfect what I mean by, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you maybe people who you consider that were good workers who do bad things and say bad things to people. And the, and you're risking that. It's really not a risk. It's really it, it's really a leverage uh, in the long term because you can get somebody who will actually do good and come in to replace that person. But ultimately, people uh, they don't because they're they get sentimental and they think, well, he really didn't mean it, and they didn't mean it, we didn't mean it, uh, and you know we can name plenty of companies that do that on a regular basis, um, even from the out on a larger scale um, in excusing behavior uh, that's contrary to what they're supposed to be standing for. And unfortunately, they uh, let their guards down and let things go. Well, that's that's where the lack of accountability kills us, Mark. Um, mm-hmm. And and if if you say something, but then don't back it up, you're not holding yourself accountable. If if a leader says something and then you get that, oh, he didn't mean it, right? He didn't mean to touch her. He didn't mean to make her feel uncomfortable. That's mm-hmm. just the way he is. You know, he's a physical guy, right? Um, then then and you're you're just enabling, you're tolerating that behavior that makes people feel uncomfortable. And and in the process, you're not building a great culture. You're actually tearing it down because. You know, if 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 our if if one of our values is uh, psychological safety, right? Mm-hmm. We we want people to know they are safe here, physically and emotionally. We 
we want this to be a safe place to talk and to work and, and to function and to grow. And then you have somebody that's that's um, not enabling that value, not 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 demonstrating the behaviors that would show us that value is mm -hmm. important to him or to her. Mm -hmm. And and it's reported, and then nothing happens about that. Well, now you're tolerating those behaviors. You're setting a standard. You're setting a precedent that says, "Well, we say we care about that, but clearly we don't." Right, and I, and even if you take a long extended time to do it, what does that say to your people too late. that you've taken too? Yeah, you've lost too them. late, too yes. late. You know, it used to be. My dad, uh, you and I have talked about this, Mark. My dad ran ran lumber lumber mills in in, in small towns yes, in Oregon when I was a kid, and we moved fourteen different times before I even went to high school. And mm -hmm. and and one of the things I I learned from him just um, is is he would take action like right now. If somebody was being disrespectful, disrespecting another employee, disrespecting based on rank, um, disrespecting mm -hmm. the company, that person was walked out the door right now. And somehow mm -hmm. we got away from that. Somehow we well, now we got to send them to HR. Well, there goes six more months of tolerating that behavior while we while we retrain it. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are examples where we want to mentor somebody. We want to redirect behaviors, right? But that has to happen in a week, not a year. That that has right. to happen in six days, not six months. And and you're absolutely right. By not taking action, we, we're showing that at least for now, for the foreseeable future, that person, we're not going to hold him accountable. We're not we're not we're not gonna make her responsible for the words she used at that meeting we're 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 gonna let her say well i was just having a bad day i'm not really like that well you've mm -hmm. you've you've not really been like that like 12 times in the last two months so maybe you are really like that and maybe we we need to find a different culture for you and yeah and you know these are the kind of things that that as you said the the carrier pigeons are just strutting all around us the signals are all around us the messages yeah. Uh, circle us and circle us and mm -hmm. we're we're just not paying attention to it and it, and by the way it's not just the leaders it's also you know candidates how many times have we seen it you know here comes the job offer and boy i really got to pay my bills or i really want to get my own place again and it's been a long time since i got you know since covid hit and and i lost my job and and we see those shiny pennies but we don't we don't stare at those carrier pigeons looking right up at us like going don't do this yeah. Don't do yeah. it. You know we're not, we're not, we're not aware enough of the impact of a bad company culture has on us psychologically. Um, it, it's it can it can tear us down. And there's literally millions of stories of people that were very good at what they do and at one time really liked the company they're working for, but it's only been three years now, and they mm -hmm. can't wait to leave. They can't wait to leave, yeah. right? And and now right. the pandemic has given them the excuse they need. Right now, sure. now, and and that's why that's why we have this max of employees, and that's why so many jobs are open right now. Right, right. They're they're not just looking at what employers have said; they're looking at what they have done, and the history tells everything that they need to know, and it's informative enough for them to to make a a, a decision that I'd rather wait and uh, stretch out my uh, budget than to be miserable. Uh, for a long time to come. So people are making that. The book is Good Comes First. Uh, we're looking at late September, early October release. Uh, Mark, any other parting words you have before we wrap it up? Well, I, I'm going to say this, the same thing your last guest said, which I thought was um, prophetic. Just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, mm -hmm. since you and I went down, started down this path, there's mm -hmm. been literally thousands of, of people that have just come and gone that, that, that haven't been there for for people who need the help you give. So I want to thank you for being there, and I want to um, implore you just to keep it up. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it coming from you. That is an honor and a privilege. And uh, thank the rest of you. I'm going to sign off. Peace in the Valley of Love. Uh, get the book. Good comes first. So thank you, Mark Babbitt. Follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter and wherever else you can. And also visit his platforms, U Turn and uh, Work IQ. Thank you very much. You all have a good day. And Mark, thank you.